With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. So thank you for being here with us in the Situation Room on Tactics, whether you're here via YouTube or Facebook or Twitch, Twitter, Periscope, any of the mediums that we're on, we appreciate you making us a part of your day. Now, we've got some things going on sort of behind the scenes here, because last night, we had the Wetumpka Tea Party Candidates Forum, which was really great because we had people all the way down from county commissioner and revenue, uh, revenue commissioner, people running for very local elections in Elmore County, all the way up to United States Senator and House of Representative candidates. And so we interviewed as many as we could. We, we couldn't get every candidate in, but we interviewed as many as we could, and we looked at the clock, and it was already, the show had been going on at that point for... Uh, well over an hour, which is the time that we're normally shooting for, so we had to go ahead and cut it off. The response was so overwhelming, and I think this is a testament to the Wetumpka Tea Party as well as the candidates themselves, that there were so many candidates that wanted to be on the air with us that when we shut it down, there were still a couple candidates that had not been interviewed that wanted to. And so what I did was, since I had already closed out the show, already run the credits and everything, I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Go ahead, we'll get you on the air, and then we will run your interview tomorrow. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. We've got a, uh, a couple of candidates that their interviews were a little bit late, and uh, I was very tired last night because it was a very long evening, and I spent pretty much the entire time flapping my gums. Uh, but what we're going to go ahead and do here is we're going to go ahead and give you that interview. Hopefully it will be as informative as the other ones were. Here it is. And welcome back, everybody. We're here at the Wetumpka Tea Party Candidates Forum, and we are here with... Uh, Robin Lodeker. I'm running for president of the Public Service Commission. All right, so the Public Service Commission is one of those things that I think a lot of people don't even realize how important it is. And uh, if you could just sort of communicate to the audience what all the Public Service Commission does and, and why it's important to have people in office that will make decisions because that is something that affects their life in a very personal way. Oh, it is. And I can't believe how many people have walked by me tonight and they've gone, well, I'm embarrassed, but I don't really know what the Public Service Commission is. Right. And it regulates utilities, transportation, telecommunication. Right. And it's supposed to be the people's voice between them and, say, the utilities. Right. And that's really what I want to do in office. I want to bring it back to where it's actually representing the people. And I want people to be able to get on the website and put their zip code in so that all the um, companies that fall under the PSC will pop up so they'll know um, who they need to talk to, uh, it is a, uh, right now, the website's kind of a mess. Um, you, it's just really hard to tell what's going on with it. I want to so, also... So it's just not navigable? Yeah, it's kind of like um, 90s. I would put it in a 90s mode. I mean, it just is cumbersome. Uh, it has a lot of outdated stuff on it. And my whole point is, it needs to be a resource. Okay. And if you're having a problem, let's say you're having a problem with the gas company. All right. And you talk to the gas company and you don't get a resolve from it, your next step is to call the PSC or contact the PSC. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize that. And 
I was an educator uh, for 33 and a half years, and um, I know how to communicate with the public, and I want people to know that they can call me up, and I'll help them in any way I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll find out the answer. Okay. Um, so I just, I want to make it where people feel like the Public Service Commission is really there for them. Well, I mean, I, I know personally, I've felt this way for a while, too. A lot of people do feel that the Public Service Commission is really there for Alabama Power <laughs> and all the companies yeah. that, that run the utilities in the state. And, and I have to say, I, you know, I think that would be something that would be a lot more refreshing if we felt like it was more representative of us and not the companies that, that run the utilities well, in the state. And, and that's, I've heard that. Mm. And, you know, that saying perception's reality I mean, it shouldn't be perceived that way. Right. And if you know that's how it's being perceived, why aren't you doing something to change it? So I want to do things like I'm going to publish every month uh, who I talk to, when I talk to them, why I'm talking to them, how I vote, why I vote the way I do. Um, I want to make it truly transparent because you know people get I'm not a politician um, public servant so you know people get in office and you don't hear from them again until four years later when they tell you how transparent and um, accountable they are yet we don't know you know so I, would, I just want to bring a level of transparency to public service that we've never seen before. My inspiration, you know, you look at our president, look what he's done, and he stands up for us and he does the right thing. And I think more of us need to go into public service for that reason. Um, I have other. Well, you know, since you brought that up, what drew you into it? Like, what made you think, I really want to be in charge of the Public Service Commission? Well, okay. Because that said, does seem obscure. You just said something. In charge. The president of the Public Service Commission is not the boss of the Public Service Commission. There are, there's a head, John Garner, he is the executive secretary, and then there are um, divisions that have heads. The president of the Public Service Commission, along with the other two commissioners, mm -hmm. are supposed to be your voice between you and, say, the utilities, mm -hmm. and there's supposed to be a balance there. Okay. And I've just, since I, I was in education, I've stood up to powerful lobbies and lobbyists before, and I... I just think that it's time that we have people here at the PSC who are willing to stand up for us. And four years from now, I shouldn't have to sit here and tell you what I've done. You ought to already know. And that's that's what I want to bring to it. All right. So All right. if somebody were interested in your campaign, they wanted to support you, they wanted to learn more about you, where would they go to do that? Uh, best place, I do have a website, but if you go to my Facebook page, elect Robin Lodeker, Alabama Public Service Commission, and like it. If you want to send me a message, send me a message. I, I, I'll call you. Uh, I want to hear from you. Okay. Um, it's... Uh, that's what I've done for a living. I've always, you know, as a teacher, I was always a public servant. So I'm um, used to listening. Uh, I was a principal. I, I, I want to hear from people. So please go to my Facebook page, and uh, I think you can Google. I'm kind of tired now. We've got a long Oh, night. yeah, we're, uh, we're at the tail end of this been, thing. This has been great. And I'll tell you, when voters are as engaged as the ones here tonight at the Wetumpka uh, Civic Center. And we had a big crowd, too, didn't we? Oh, yeah. I believe we're going to be in better shape. I think uh, 2020 is going to be the year of just the, the regular people getting in office. And, and I would love to be able to say, I'm a, you know, I'm a regular person. I've had a career. This isn't going to be my career. This is going to be my service to you. And... 
and I would love to think this is just a start of seeing more of that. All right. Well, thank you so okay. much, Robin Lidiker. Thank you. Running for public Lidiker. service. Lidiker. Lidiker. Lidikers have money. Lidikers don't have money. Ah, see, now I know the distinction. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for thank being you. with us. We appreciate it. Hi, Mr. Pretty. Good Friday. Friday. How are you? Friday. Oh, it's Friday. Yes, it's Friday. So it's pronounced like the day, even though it's there's no way. It's pronounced like the day of the week, as we say it in the South. Ah, Friday. 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 Yeah. I get Freddy all the time. I answer to anything. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I'm Cockwit. Nobody ever knows how to pronounce my <laughs> name. I mean, my listeners do, but that's only because I'm talking to them, not, you know, on. For sure. On, but, you know. Sure. Anyway. Well, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, you're running for Civil Court of Appeals? Court of Civil Appeals. That's court right. of Civil Appeals. Yes. Okay. Place number two. All right. <laughs> so, um, when it comes to civil appeals, you know, that's not a Supreme Court position. It's probably not one that gets nearly the uh, the glitz and glamour. <laughs> so uh, try to explain to the average voter sure. exactly what that does and why it's important to have somebody like yourself in that office. Sure. Well, you know, we've got three primary layers of courts in the, in, in the Alabama court system. Right. You have your trial courts, which are district courts and circuit courts. That's where you'll have your jury trials. That's where a lot of these things are decided. A lot of cases mm -hmm. are decided. If there's an appeal, it's a criminal case that goes to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals first. Right. And then if, if somebody's still not happy with the result there, then it can be appealed up to the Alabama Supreme Court. On the civil side, most civil cases go directly to the Supreme Court, but there are certain ones that go to the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals first. Mm -hmm. And that's any case involving workers' compensation, any case involving family law or DHR matters, and any kind of domestic relations type cases, um, appeals from administrative agencies, and then any civil case involving less than $50,000. Those four kinds of cases go directly to the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals. And then in addition to that, almost any kind of civil case that goes directly to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can deflect that to the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals. So they can look at it and say, no, we want to let you guys handle this first. That's and correct. Then if, if, you know, if there's another appeal, we'll handle it then. Correct. That's okay. right. So, you know, when it comes to that, and, and this is one of the things that I love about these local events because we get to talk to a lot of the candidates that are down ballot mm -hmm. that you don't hear as much about because, yes, it's very important who the president and who our senators sure. are, but at the same time, like, it doesn't get more personal or important than your kids. That's right. And that's one of the things that the Court of Civil, uh, the, the Court of Civil Appeals actually handles. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's, you know, in my... In my um, in my practice, I really had a unique opportunity, and that was to go to serve as a staff attorney mm -hmm. on the Court of Civil Appeals in the Alabama Supreme Court for about seven years. I've been practicing since I, well, I graduated law school in 2001. Was at a, was at a law firm for a few years, then went to the courts. As a what staff law school attorney. were you at? Cumberland, up at Sanford. Okay, cool. Graduated, like I said, in 2001. I actually served as a federal law clerk for my first year out of law school, then went to a law firm, and then spent about seven years from 2005 to 2012 as a staff attorney on the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals in the Alabama Supreme Court. And while I was on the Court of Civil Appeals, I just fell in love with the work that that court does, those, those kinds of cases we talked about earlier. Right. Just fell in love with, with the appellate aspect of that and really digging into the law. Um, 2012, I went back into private practice uh, at a firm called Wallace Jordan in Birmingham, and the bulk of my practice for the last eight years, I do some agricultural law, but then uh, I focus um, pretty heavily on appellate work. So I do a lot of work that ends up in front of the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals and the Alabama Supreme Court. Gotcha. Well, when it comes to the uh, the workman's comp, like I'll be honest, that's an area of law that I'm almost completely unfamiliar with. Sure. So uh, what exactly would that entail? Is it specifically only things that deal with injuries or? Generally speaking, it's it's on-the-job injuries. Okay. So employers will have insurance policies, work, workers' compensation insurance policies, and if there's a worker that's injured um, at their place of work okay. under certain circumstances, it'd be compensable. And yeah. so they, they could file a lawsuit against the employer, a work comp lawsuit, and if they could prove that it arose out of it in the course of their employment, then they'd be entitled to, to certain kinds of uh, monetary relief. Now, this is a question that I get to ask a lot, and I, I don't know how much it affects, uh, but, well, I'll just go ahead and ask it uh, without all the, the rigmarole. <laughs> um, I always like asking this to, to legal professionals and judges that are, that are running because it's something that just fascinates me. What would you say your legal theory falls? Would you say that you're more of an originalist? Um, would you say that you're a, a textualist? Like, wh where would you say that your 
um, your legal theory kind of springs from? Sure, I think that's a great question, and I'm an originalist and a textualist. Okay. And those those are they can be competing ideas at time, but the, at times. But the way that I marry those is is this: I think the best way to figure out what was originally intended by a lawmaker mm -hmm. or by lawmakers is to look at the words that they used. But there are times that words take on different meanings over time. Sure. If you want to know what a lawmaker meant, uh, if you want to know the, 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 the founding fathers when they drafted the Constitution and all, if you want to know what they meant, what you do is you look at the words they used and then you open up a dictionary that was written around that same time that the law was passed. And you apply that definition to determine what it was that was intended by the lawmaker. Okay. Um, like I said, if you, if you want to know what due process in the 14th Amendment means, don't look at the words due and process as what they mean today. Pick up a dictionary from the 1860s. What, is due, what does the phrase due process mean? And define it that way. That way you can get to the original intent of the drafters, but at the same time you're staying true to the text that they used and the words that they used. So even though they are different legal theories, primarily you're, you're trying to get to the same place using both of them. That's correct. That's, that's exactly right. Right. So when it comes to that, would you say that you're an incorporationalist when it comes to, for example, the Bill of Rights? You know, I think that we have to be, we have to be somewhat careful when we start talking. Uh, we can't, uh, somebody who's running for judge, I can't go too far into my theories. And I understand that. I don't so want to get you in trouble. I can't, can't, uh, can't prejudge any particular case. But I will say this. The Due Process Clause protects us in our life. Mm -hmm. well, we understand what our life is. Our, our property, we understand what that means. But it also protects our liberty. Now, what does that mean? Our life, our liberty, and our, and our property. What is liberty? And, and, and through incorporation, we kind of breathe life into what liberty means. And I think that that's been a constant struggle for the U.S. Supreme Court mm -hmm. in determining what the word liberty means. Does it incorporate the right to keep and bear arms? The Supreme Court has said emphatically yes. And not only is that incorporated, it, it applies to the states, it applies to local governments as well through the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. So yeah, I do um, believe that incorporation is one tool that can be used to determine what does liberty mean when we talk about you can't be deprived of your liberty without due process of law. I think our, our first eight amendments um, largely you can look to as a source for what, what our founders thought liberty was, the right to free speech, the right to free exercise. Right. Those, are, those are liberty interests. And so we can call it incorporation if we want, but what we could do instead is just to look at the word liberty and say, what, what, what did the founders mean when they said liberty? Well, we've got eight amendments that give us a pretty good idea of their thoughts on what liberty really means. Yeah, well, when it comes to that, um, and again, I'm, I know that this is always a Anytime you, you have a judge that's running for something, it's always difficult to ask questions because you know there's certain things they just can't answer. Right, right. Um, so if I'm, if I'm probing too much, let me know. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to, to things like, um, I, I know that there's been a recent movement that has kind of gained some traction about how men are somewhat discriminated against when it comes to family law and that women are, you know, for certain reasons, kind of given a little bit of the benefit of the doubt when it comes to things like child custody. So um, do you have any thoughts on that, or do you think that it's it's largely overblown, or do you think that there's actually some validity to the people that are making some of these complaints? Well, I'll say this, and I'm not trying to be a politician and dodge the question, but that's kind of one of those issues that would be in front of the Court of Civil Appeals on a regular basis, and so I have to be very yes. careful about how I was afraid of that. a question like that. I will say that you know, fundamentally we need to look at the best interest of the child, and we need to look at the rights of the parent when those, the, of the rights of both parents mm -hmm. when those decisions are being made. I serve in the legislature presently, and of course family law is an issue that comes up regularly within the legislature we've done a lot of work on. I have a lot of friends in the, uh, the Family Rights Association and other organizations, really on both sides of that issue, but uh, it's certainly an issue I've dug into. It's an issue that I understand, and um, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm well positioned to bring that understanding of family law um, to the Alabama Court of Civil Appeals. All right. Well, um, if somebody has seen this, they're interested in your campaign, and they want to vote for you or support your campaign in some way, where would they go to do that? Uh, we have a website, FridayForJudge.com, F-R-I-D-Y, for Judge, dot com. And we're also on Facebook, um, okay. uh, Matt Friday for Court of Civil Appeals. All right. Well, Matt Friday, running for the Court of Civil Appeals, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. All right.
Well, there you have it. That was the Wetumpka Tea Party candidates forum. We had a couple extra candidates for you. Hopefully they've been just as informative as the other, I think, seven. We wound up doing, if I'm not mistaken, nine candidates in all, or candidates or people that were lobbying for a particular position. We had a couple that weren't actually uh, candidates themselves. But one of the reasons that we do this and the reason that we think it's so important is because especially when it comes to local elections, we as conservatives, we constantly preach to people. And we do it because I think the vast majority of us actually believe this, that yes, it's important who is our senator. Yes, it's important who is our congressman. Yes, it's important who our president is. But that's not the only election that matters. In fact, the way that a federalist or a constitutionalist would look at it, ideally what we should be striving for is for our local governments and local officials to be the ones that have the primary impact on our life. That, yes, the president and Congress has some impact on our life, but really not much, and unless it's wartime, you would basically not be able to ideally tell the difference between who is president and who is Congress and, and who is not. And so that's what's important, just like I've always said when it comes to government programs versus charities, if we want the government to do less, we have to be willing to do more. And the same is true when it comes to these local elections. If we want the federal government to quit being the, the sugar daddy, if we want the federal government to quit lording over the states and individual towns, municipalities, counties, all of those things, and, and get more out of the way, get regulation out of the way, then we have to be willing to do the hard work and look down ballot and look at the individual candidates here at the local level because if we want them to have the most power, the most control, and the most direct influence over our lives, which, I mean, I don't want any government to have that much influence over my life, but I'd want the one that has the most to be the ones that are most accountable to me, the ones that I could go just down the road as opposed to having to drive to D.C. to lobby, and the ones that are going to be most familiar with my personal problems, my community, that kind of thing. And so if we want the federal government to do less, we have to say that our local government and our state government needs to do the role that currently, in a lot of ways, the federal government is doing. That's why these individual elections are so incredibly important. And so we greatly encourage you to look up more about the candidates, the ones that we interviewed and the ones that we weren't able to interview or the ones that weren't there. Do your research. Do your own homework so that when you do go in to vote this year, in November, you're actually informed on the candidates, you know the differences in their policies, you've studied it, and you've made an informed decision as to who you want to select as your representative. And that's more important at the local level, or at least should be, even more so than it would be for the president or your senator or congressman. That's the country we ought to be striving for. That's all the time I've got for today. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020.